I'll start by describing why I'm here. Uh, for many years I've worked on biomedical ontologies and um, Hedy Carré, who is in this room, uh, asked if he could come to Buffalo to work with me and I assumed he was coming to work on biomedical ontologies. And he arrived and he said, you've built this thing called the Oboe Foundry, which is Open Biomedical Ontologies Foundry, which is a strategy for building a single dictionary across all of the life sciences. Why don't we build a thing called the Industrial Ontologies Foundry? And you could talk to this friend of mine in Switzerland, namely Dimitris Kiritsis, who will give you some ideas about people who would be interested in using that thing. So we did, or anyway, we started talking about it, and by some miracle, NIST, which is the US National Institute of Standards and Technology, became interested in the idea, and for the last two years they have been organizing a series of meetings and uh, phone calls and working groups, some of which I will describe quickly in what follows so that you can see how it works. So the problem, uh, the problem is that we have a world of digital manufacturing, an industrial world in general, which is becoming more and more interconnected, more and more flexible, more and more reliant upon collaborations between different enterprises and different parts of enterprises. And all of this collaboration and communication has to be organized in large part at least by information systems. And so people build software, proprietary software, and people buy those bits of proprietary software and they never work well together. And, uh, and so they go to consultants and the consultants charge a million dollars to write bigger software plans which will work together, packages which spread across an entire enterprise. And they don't work either. That enterprise has customers or suppliers, they won't work anymore. So we have a major problem. And this major problem is made worse by the fact that software and hardware are changing every six months. So even if you have a good system on Wednesday, six months later, it won't be a good system anymore because you had to change, or someone had to change somewhere, the hardware or the software or the personnel or the goals. Now, as Robert made clear, at least a partial solution to this problem is something like a common dictionary. And I think it's reasonable to think of the uh, ontologies that we're building as constituting a common dictionary. I, I'll try and explain how this is supposed to work in a minute. A common terminological, frame, a common terminological framework which will have the needed accessibility and ex uh, flexibility and extendability to cope with the fact that hardware and goals and personnel and so forth are all changing, but at the same time remain stable. And it works a bit like the English language. So the English language is changing all the time, but most of it never changes. Table, chair, apple, banana, on, off, and so on. These words stay the same, and then at the fringes, we have new words for things like polysaccharides. Now, ontologies have mostly failed. And the reasons ontologies fail are exactly the same reason for the, why big, ambitious information systems fail. Software is changing, hardware is changing, personnel is changing. People decide they don't like ontologies anymore because they keep failing. And then Robert comes along and explains why we need them. So these are the reasons why ontologies fail. People think it's easy, so everyone wants to build their own ontologies. Then they get paid. If you reuse someone else's ontology, you won't get paid. Disaster ensues. No one knows how to build ontologies. It's not easy. There is no common methodology. I believe that there is a common methodology, but that's another story. Uh, people write ontologies for the four years that they have funding from the European Union and then they stop and go away. Mm -hmm. A short half-life. 
they didn't have time to write the documentation, so no one knows how they did it. But that doesn't matter because they failed anyway and they have disappeared. <laughs> All right, so how do we build an ontology that framework that will succeed? So it has to be open, it has to be English language, it has to be global, so it has to be in English. So that's probably not needing to be said in this audience. I am speaking English after all. In a, in a building, the address of which is number one, Truth Street. Um, all right, we need definitions, but we need definitions not merely in English, but also formalized definitions. And then that collection, which should be rather small, will be used by all those software developers, this is the goal anyway, all those proprietary software developers creating software for specific niches in the digital manufacturing world will use those ontologies as their starting point. That's the trick. And then they will get the benefit of at least the terminological interoperability, which is a sine qua non terminological interoperability, which is a sine qua non of success in interoperability. All right, now we did it. We succeeded. There is one big success story in ontology, and that started as a result of the Human Genome Project in the end of the 1990s in the building of something called the Gene Ontology, which is by far the world's most successful ontology in terms of numbers of users, degree of funding, degree of, of cost benefit, um, degree of users, documentation, understanding, ability to keep pace with scientific advance in a very, very technologically rapidly changing area. The re one reason why the gene ontology succeeded is because it was the only game in town. There was only one ontology for describing gene sequence information, and now also protein sequence information, other kinds of sequence information. And now the gene ontology is used to describe, practically speaking, the whole of biology. Now, because it was the only game in town, all biologists interested in bioinformatics used it, and so it became a lingua franca. It became the English language of the life sciences. And it, that meant that people could describe data using it and know that their data would thereby become accessible to other biologists who also use the same terminology, namely the gene ontology, for describing their data. And that meant that their data and your data became interoperable. And that recipe expanded. It became a, a, a virtuous snowball where the more users of the gene ontology you had, the more attractive it became for new users to use the gene ontology. It was a success. It allowed tagging of genomic data in terms of biology terms. Not polysaccharide, but terms like death or perception or mating behavior. And the, these are the terms on the right, and the, the data is on the left. And the, the data came not just from humans, but from mouse, fly, fish, and so forth. And now there are thousands of genomes which are tagged using the same dictionary. But the gene ontology didn't cover all of biology in the same degree. It covered biological processes. It didn't cover anatomy. It didn't cover cell types. It didn't cover proteins. It didn't cover the structures of sequences themselves. It was, a, it was a vehicle for tagging sequences, not for describing sequences. And it didn't cover disease. And so we created the Oboe Foundry, which is a collection of ontologies built, a collection of ontologies built around the gene ontology, roughly speaking, to serve as a dictionary for the whole of biology. And for instance, it, part of this dictionary is an, a chemistry ontology. So this is the Obo Foundry website, that's the logo. It's meant to be hard work, so we have an anvil, the hot fire of, uh, of science. And th there are something like 90 ontologies on this list, of which a dozen are accredited reference ontologies for biology. And the structure is a hub and spokes structure. 
So um, the, the, there is a hub in the middle, which is a, the, the BFO, which was mentioned already, and then there are, the gene ontology is in the first group, the chemistry ontology is in this first group, and then in the second group are application ontologies, which are creation ontologies, which are created by specific subdisciplines or by specific research groups working on specialized fields who use the content of the reference ontologies nearer to the middle of the modular structure in formulating their specialist terms. So this was the first sketch of what the oboe foundry should look like. And the gene ontology is marked out in yellow there. We have organism taxonomy, cell types, different molecule ontologies, and so forth. And then it grew to encompass, for instance, the information artifact ontology, uh, with the environment ontology, uh, the population ontology, and so forth. And uh, gradually, people started to experiment with the same hub and spokes approach outside biomedicine. So we have, for instance, the common core ontologies, which are used in military research, which are used in military research. We have the, um, uh, the United Nations Environment Programme Sustainable Development Ontology, which is a collection of ontologies used in uh, supporting sustainable de development data management for the United Nations. And now we have the Industrial Ontologies Foundry. So the goal is the same as for the Oboe Foundry. We're going to create a suite of interoperable reference ontologies. And this is a picture of how it might look. So we have a top-level ontology, which is shared across all the other ontologies, and then some mid-level ontologies for things like units of measure, and then uh, product life cycle ontology unifying everything from design to end of life. And then we have things like a test ontology, we have a chemistry ontology, we have ontologies for specific kinds of manufacturing, such as additive manufacturing. Some of these now exist in very rough draft form. And, um, and then the goal is to support interoperability along the lines I described at the beginning. And we have uh, an organization, we have a governance board, technical oversight boards, some of the some of these boards are represented in this room. And then we have a number of working groups. So these are three working groups that I will mention. Uh, at production planning, maintenance, supply chain. And um, just some of the benefits. So if, if I'd heard Robert's talk before, I would have just talked about the benefits. Um, so the benefits I think he talked about. Uh, we have a common dictionary with a methodology for maintaining that dictionary over time. And that dictionary is very lightweight. It doesn't talk about specific products or specific enterprises. It talks about the kinds of things that all products and all enterprises share. Things like product or price or design and so forth. But it does this in a way which involves formalized definitions which enable First of all, computation, it, which can be used, for instance, to check the consistency of the ontologies as they are joined together, but then also application to more granular ontologies for specific enterprises. Uh, and I will finish just with a couple of remarks about one example, which is a, a supply chain. So this comes from Farhad Amari, who is in the room. And um, he's been working for some time on the manufacturing supply chain ontology. We have a manufacturing supply chain group within the IO foundry. And supply chain is about things like the capabilities of suppliers. Which supplier can I about things like the capabilities of suppliers? Which supplier can I use for this particular gadget that I want to build? Which suppliers are geographically conveniently located, have the capabilities, have the experience, have the reputation, and so forth. And so people build databases. Governments build databases of these things, and they all build them differently. And then they build another one. Another part of the government will build it differently again, and they don't work together. So let's start by having a common dictionary for these things. And the challenge listed by um, Fahad. So the information we have about capabilities 
Even the information we have about the meanings of terms describing capabilities is often out of date, particularly when the world of manufacturing is changing so rapidly. So what we need, and this would be one of the reference ontologies within the IO Foundry, is an ontology for disabilities associated with those services. And then the idea is that somebody wants to buy a certain kind of machine part. So we need an ontology of the relevant kinds of machine parts so that we can search and find out those enterprises which can make or which have evidence that they can make those kinds of machine parts. Or we need some kind of service and then we have an ontology which describes different kinds of services and then we need to go from the need for the service on the right hand side to the supplier of the service on the left hand side and match the two by means of information. And then finally we may need a certain kind of equipment. So we have an ontology of equipment, we need this equipment in our factory, who can supply this equipment and so forth. All the IOF provides is a dictionary with computational support for the terms you need to find specific kinds of, for example, equipment and capabilities. So there are different kinds of capabilities. We need a good dictionary of those kinds of capabilities with definitions. We need, we need to know what a capability is.